Sambudasa, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambudasa, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambudasa, homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So today, uh, let's see, May is recording, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, everybody. Happy to see you. So today, uh, what we're going to do is I've been having fun this morning. I, th I started doing this early this morning, and I thought this was a simple thing that I was going to do. And um, it might be that we have to do these two uh, separately because of, um, of uh, getting into them. But the idea here is to really look seriously into agitation because agitation is the source for the disturbance of your meditation. And what happens to you is the agitation when you get upset with anything that is um, uh, like a disturbance, distraction, uh, you know, an obstacle in your meditation. This, this beginning of this, of course, is sitting in the dependent origination process. But to understand, uh, we, we need to go back and we need to look at a couple of suttas that were sitting side by side. So the, the two suttas are 138 and 139. Both of them are stressing the agitation and how it's going. Okay. I'm going to have to keep drinking this hot stuff, you know, I got uh, spasms yesterday in my neck, so I'm going to have to keep reaching for that. <clears throat> okay, you can all hear me, right? You can hear me okay? Okay. So we'll start, um, I think what we're going to do is start with 38. And um, if you've gone in and reviewed this, I'm going to take you into what I was doing. Uh, what I wanted you to do with this was, if you have your books, is to bring up, bring up 138. And then as we go through it, let's mark the parts that we really need to drill into our mind about this, okay? So I'm going to take you over to this share screen. I was playing with this this morning. Remember, have mercy on me because I can't. I, I can't always, I don't know why it's giving me a half screen here. Why is it doing that, May? I can't, what is this? <laughs> well, we'll deal with half screen. I don't know why I have half screen. Uh, Sister Kema, can you close and reopen the file? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, you mean the file itself? You mean the file itself? Okay, just a second. Let me see if I can do that. Hmm? How can I do that? Um, I did save it. All right, let me go to the word close it and open it again. Okay, now open it again. There, okay, now go back to you guys. Mm -hmm. Come back to the share screen. <laughs> See grandmother's hiking through the wilderness of tech. <laughs> okay. Okay, and we'll come here. Okay, so we're going to go through Udasa Vibhanga and, um, and unravel this a little bit. So we'll start at the beginning. It's the um, exposition of a summary, but really what this is about is the mind being scattered or the mind being scattered externally or stuck internally. That's what it's talking about, but it's also going to be pointing to um, it's going to be pointing to agitation and how it's working. 
So thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetis Grove in Nathapindicus Park. And there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhu thus, monks, venerable sir, they replied, and the Blessed One said this, and the bhikkhus, I shall teach you a summary and an exposition. Listen carefully, uh, closely to what I shall say. The venerable sir, uh, they said yes, and then we go into it. Now here, I'm just gonna read highlights to you, so I might not be reading this directly, the whole thing, but he's basically saying the when you're practicing, you should examine things in such a way that while you are examining them, your consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor does it get stuck internally. And by not clinging, you do not become agitated. So right at the beginning, he's telling you that the source of your agitation, it's the source of your restlessness, the source of your doubt, the source of uh, all these pieces is the is the the place where it trips off agitation. That's what we're looking at here. Okay, so you should examine things in such a way that he, that when you're examining them, your consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally. Now he's going to explain this. If his consciousness is not distracted. Um, or scattered externally, not stuck internally. If it's not, and if it's, if by not clinging, he does not become agitated, then for him, there is no origination of suffering. So he's saying all the suffering starts from this point of agitation. This is what happens with this. I have to go back here. Whoops, somewhere. Yeah, here. Where is it? Mm -hmm. That's what the Blessed One said. And having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and he went into his dwelling. Well, we all know about that scene. <laughs> the young monks have the monk, uh, have the Buddha sometime in the camp and they're sitting there talking to him. They're all excited because they're talking to him and they're listening. And then as soon as he finishes saying one paragraph, what does he do? He waits, he does pause, he pauses, but they don't know yet. They're not supposed to let him get up and go in his hut. So we end up with the monks going to uh, Mahakachana, who is a prime teacher in the camp, uh, the Buddha, the meditation school, and he's gonna have to unravel this for them. We also know that most of the time in these suttas, he scolds them before he answers them because they let the teacher get away. <laughs> so soon after the blessed one had gone, these monks, they go over to Maha Kachana and they sit down with him and they ask him to expound the meaning. And that's what you find in five. So then the monks uh, go to him. And this whole thing at seven, eight, and nine is the story of what happens when um, he is explaining to them, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be letting him go in the hut. You should be keeping him with you. And so he has the heartwood that you sought among the branches and the leaves of the great tree. And when you're sitting there with somebody who has the heartwood and is teaching you the heartwood in seven, he's talking like this. And he's basically explaining to them, you don't let him go and, and go away. So surely the friend, they say, surely friend Kachana, knowing the blessed one knows and sees his vision and the Tathagata and all of this, surely, you will help us because you're so wise. So now they're sort of like kissing up and saying, please tell us what this meant, okay? And then listen, listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. And he'll explain it and break it down. So now he's going to tell them what's going on. How, friends, is consciousness called distracted and scattered externally? And when, the, when a bhikkhu or a monk, when you, a student, has seen a form with the eye, if your consciousness follows after the sign of this form, 
and gets tied and shackled by gratification in this sign of the form. And gratification, remember, is you are feeling good about what you're seeing and you want to see it more and spend time with it. Okay. And it's fettered by the fetter of gratification. The fetter is the gratification, you getting liking this and thinking more about how great it is. And then his consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. And you know, this is a problem these days because everybody has certain addictions and ideas. Everybody thinks only addicts have addictions. It's really not true. There's a lot of people that have addictions to feeling good, addictions to joy in meditation, addictions to this and addictions to that. And these, these things where you want to stay and you want more encourage you to believe that you're making everything happen in your practice. And this is what's slowing down people. This is what's keeping you from being able to flow down the path and experience the different things because of this holding on. So when he's heard a sound with the ear or an odor with the nose or tasted a flavor with the tongue or touched a tangible with the body or cognized any kind of thought with the mind, his consciousness follows after the sign of the mind object, he becomes tied and shackled by it. So if you know this is the danger and you feel this pulling towards, this is talking about, um, you know, seeing it and then feeling this pull toward this, that's a point where you let go because we're telling you that the arising of the craving the arising of this desire to hold on, to like it and want it is a change in your, uh, your tension and tightness in your mind and body. So we're asking you to sense that. Now, I'll tell you a secret. This is one of the reasons why the Goenka practice, the practitioner can do extremely well if they will just surrender to the teacher and allow us to take them on a trip to discover this practice they can use the sensitivity. They've been trained to notice any tiny thing that's happening in their body anywhere, see? And they are very sensitive to the moment there is a change in tension and tightness. So rather than condemn or say anything bad about that practice, it's silly, absolutely silly, because those were the girls, the, the nuns, for instance, in the 16 nuns that I taught, those are the ones that just went just like that and they got it and they started moving down and moving through things perfectly and they had no knowledge of anything that they were experiencing before they didn't read a book in advance they didn't try to memorize the levels or anything like that none of that had to be coped with because none of them had read anything and so here they are why are they moving so fast because they're sensitive. They were taught to be sensitive to this, to this change in tension and tightness, okay? So then in, in, uh, when the, it doesn't matter which one of the sense doors you're talking about, this can happen where you can get stuck. And to go to 11, how friends is, uh, is consciousness called not distracted and scattered externally? Well, here, when a monk, has uh, when a student has seen a form with the eye, if the consciousness does not follow after the sign or the form, is not tied and shackled with by gratification, good feelings, wanting to stay there with it, um, in in the sign of the form, is not fettered, doesn't get fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the form. Well, then his consciousness is called not distracted and not scattered externally. So this is to this, this part that's outside, okay? The scattered externally, okay? And when he has heard the sound with the ear the same way, smelt the odor, the nose, uh, okay, tasted the flavor with the tongue, touched the tangible with the body, cognized the mind objects with the mind. If the consciousness does not follow, here you go. So this is a case where, guess what? Hmm. You actually steer where your consciousness is going to go. That's another point here showing you that you're actually pretty powerful. You're not weak. You're powerful if you understand how things actually work. And when you understand how things actually work, 
your consciousness will not follow after the sign of the mind object and it won't get tied and shackled to the gratification in the sign of the mind object and it will not become fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the mind object and his consciousness is called not distracted and scattered externally. So this is one of the things most people couldn't uh, explain to someone if uh, somebody said, well, how do you get scattered externally or stuck internally? And this is your answer. This is how this is working with the experience of any one of the six sense doors. And how does it get stuck internally? Well, here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, when you're sitting and when you enter the first jhana, the components that are in the first jhana, especially the uplifted joy that you experience, and the uplifted joy when that's experienced, you want to stay with that. A lot of people want to stay, gimme, 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 gimme. And there was an old, um, <laughs> it comes like there was a, um, a really cute commercial when my kids were growing up with Maypo cereal. I don't know if you ever saw it on TV, but it was cute because the little boy, little boy was in his high chair and the other two boys were eating cereal, but mom gave the little one the Maypo and the boys wanted the Maypo. They didn't want um, the other kind of cereal. So the boys would trick the little one in the high chair and say, look at me. And the other one would eat some Maypo. And then the little one would start screaming, I want my Maypo. And this is what's happening to you. I want to see, I want to hold on to what's in here. I like it. I want to hold on to it. And you don't have any sisters or brothers to slap you around and take, you know, try to convince you not to do that. Hmm? Okay, so the first jhana is showing you how you can get stuck internally. You get stuck by the gratification and the joy and the happiness that's born in seclusion. The rapture and pleasure is joy and happiness born of seclusion. And then you get stuck in there. You want to stay there. Okay, now. Again, with the stilling in the second jhana, you have the things that go through. And if this consciousness follows after the joy and pleasure born of concentration, then he's going to get stuck internally there. Is that still there? He's still going to hold on to it. That's what's going to capture him. And here he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful in the third jhana. And that one, that one, if he gets stuck with this, and really likes it, he's going to get stuck internally again. And the fourth jhana, the fourth jhana is talking about equanimity, okay? And when he's talking about equanimity, using the fourth jhana's description here, they're using, in this sutta, I was trying to point out to you that they're using the fourth, fourth uh, four jhana description of this whole adventure. They're not talking about eight. They're talking about four, but it's inclusive of someone who is suffering when they get to a point of the infinite space or infinite consciousness. And they like what those two levels are, get fascinated with them, and they don't want to go any further. They just want to stay there. They want more and more of this. People get fascinated with it. And then they get to nothingness and they get annoyed, annoyed. Now let's see what happens here. And how, friends, is the mind called not stuck internally is if you were to just not follow after the joy and happiness in the seclusion, not follow in, fall in love with it and, you know, get emotionally wanting to stay there liking it, then you would not be stuck internally, okay? And if you're in the second jhana, you would not, if you were not, uh, the consciousness does not follow after the joy and happiness that is there. The thoughts stop in the second jhana, thinking and examining thoughts really kind of stop, but the joy and the happiness is still there. And if you try to follow after that you're going to you're, you're going to be if you don't follow after that then you're not stuck internally and the third one is talking about the stronger joy in the third stronger joy that's happening in the third jhana 
and his consciousness does not follow after the equanimity, the experience of the equanimity does not get hooked on it. So all of this is telling you something. It's telling you that the safest way for you to examine all these things is to pretend you're Admiral Byrd. <laughs> pretend that you are, pretend you're an explorer who is going someplace where you've never been before. And then you can't be saying it's like this, like that, like, you know, the uh, bougainville in the South is blooming. You can't describe it this way. <laughs> you can't talk about it that way. You're going into a place that no one's ever been. You need to take this mental mindset, which is described in 111 so well that Sariputra was using, and you need to be watching to see if you can see each thing as it arises, it's there, and it passes away. And he keeps repeating in the Anupada Sutta, he keeps repeating the description of his mindset, you see. He noted, what does he see one by one as they're occurring? He is so precise at watching just what's happening, that he's watching it. It wasn't there, it's arising. It is there and it passes away. And he's telling you this again and again. He's telling you this in each state that he goes through. He's able to do this. He was so curious about the workings of how everything operated. He wanted to be the one who could explain to anyone. And that's why he became uh, the mother at the door with all the questions that you have in the beginning of your training to help you get through that. He had all those answers because he practiced in this specific way with this mindset of just watching what it is, not trying to hook it to anything else you know. And you know, we were talking this morning at breakfast, we were talking about, so what is the most aggravating part of agitation? Hmm. The most, aggravating part of getting frustrated or uh, getting agitated is when you just can't match up something that you are observing with anything in your personal encyclopedia that you have built in your mind from the time you were a little girl or a little boy. You're building up this big, big, thing in your mind, your own world book encyclopedia or encyclopedia Britannica of everything the whole time you're living. So you take a child and you do this meditation, just like that, they get it. They don't have any encyclopedia yet to worry about. You put them even up to the nine-year-olds and they don't, they, they, I say, okay, now just be quiet, and now I want you to do exactly what I'm telling you, and there, they do it. There's no problem. They're not going to compare it to this one, that one, the one in China, the one in South America, the one over here, the one over there. They're not going to do any of that. They're going to do just what I tell them to do, and by golly, gosh, gee whiz, oof, there it goes. Boom. It works. I'll be darn. It's just right here, right here. It's telling you, don't pay attention to anything is what this is saying. So he gets to the third jhana and he's not stuck internally. He gets the fourth jhana. He is not stuck internally. How, friends, is their agitation due to clinging? Here, an untaught ordinary person has no regard for the noble ones. What does that mean? What does that mean, really? No training. No prior training and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma. What's the dhamma? The dhamma is precisely being able to understand the components you need to understand and get to the path smoothly and move down the path, you know, move down the path smoothly without getting uh, upset by it at all, just as an observation thing. We're telling you where the final piece for the clock is so that you can finish making that clock that you're making in class at the university. <laughs> you're trying to make this, this clock so that you can get through the course. And I have the final pieces. You, in order to see it, you have to let go of everything. 
because it's different. Hmm? Because it's different. So his consciousness, the, that material form of his changes and it becomes otherwise. Well, let's go back up here where the training is. You know, who, who uh, the train, he doesn't have training and he's unskilled and undisciplined. He's undisciplined at taking what? And he's undisciplined at taking instructions just as they're told and not doing anything else to it. We live in a time, mix and match, put it in the bowl, stir it up. How do you think the Buddhist church came into existence in the United States? I talk to people and they say, oh, it's a wonderful place. Yeah, we've got the Vajrayana this and the Mahayana that and the Theravada this and the Sudavada, what's it? And we got Zen, we got this, we got that, we got this. You can sit in a pew or you can bring a pillow and sit on the floor. You know, I'm waiting for the communion. <laughs> waiting you know everything we had in our regular old church service we have here but we're going to be buddhist now how do you think it became possible to be a jewish buddhist or a christian buddhist or a hindu buddhist or an anything buddhist you see the problem it's for everybody this teaching you see and the problem is we decided we had to be buddhist that's the real problem here you know, if we took it and gave it to everybody, we would be solving the problem. You know, I have to tell you about this. This last week, I discovered something. There's a, bi a biologist in uh, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand. And if you haven't heard it, if you haven't bumped into it on the internet, I don't know how you can't because the advertisements on every single page, every single where, all over the place. You got to go and you got to listen to what is happening that he discovered the solution for all of mankind to be at peace in the whole entire world. Uh, the only problem was, in my opinion, I listened to the, the main kickoff uh, talk, which was 15 minutes, part one, 15, part two, 15, part three, 15.4. We sat here and listened to it. And it's a wonderful idea. But guess what? There's no delivery system at the end. And I said, you know, we got to get this guy on the phone. <laughs> We have to get him on the phone because what we're talking about is a delivery system that I can teach a taxi driver. I can teach a truck driver. I can teach a professor. I can teach anybody how to feel better and how to relax more and let go of tension, let go of time. If you only will just do what the specifics are and nothing else. I didn't tell you you have to do it. I didn't tell you you have to accept it. All I'm telling you is take it and try it and see what happens. That's what I'm doing. That's all I want to do anymore. I am certainly not going to proselytize for any Buddhists to become Buddhists. I don't care if you become a Buddhist and I don't care who hears me saying this. I really don't. Buddhists were supposed to promulgate, not proselytize. And there are certain people who have big conferences who are promoting proselytizing in the next hundred years to get more Buddhists. I think first we need to back up and figure out what the Buddha taught. I think we first need to have people know things even in Asian countries, other than by listening to a parroting version of learning something, what it is they're saying and what it is they're talking about and what it is this really was. Because this is the answer to what he was talking about. This biologist, it begins with a G. I think his last name is Griffith, I think. Jeremy Griffith or something. I'm sorry, I can't remember things very well right now. But if you go and find this person, you listen to that introduction talk. And that introduction talk is an introduction talk of telling you, uh, you know, of what the Buddha intended, what he wanted to have happen. But he did something really strange. The Buddha, he told you how to do it. <laughs> he told you how to do it. And he told you in a way that you can do it while you're walking, while you're sleeping, while you're working all the time. There's an answer for living. There's an answer for dying. There's an answer for why you're here, where you came from, all the rest of it is there. 
but it is not really supposed to have been a religion to become a religion if you want the truth. This was supposed to make you a better whatever you were, wherever you are. That's what the uh, Dalai Lama said about it. So anyway, coming back to this, it all comes back to being agitated or not being agitated. Now I have someone right now who's stuck in nothingness. Of course he's stuck. Why is he stuck? Well, here's the answer. His consciousness is preoccupied with the change of of material form. And he's used to seeing that. He, he's the change of material form arising and passing away. And it starts to obsess his mind. And he's used to, you know, this happening, to having this happen. And then all of a sudden he falls into nothingness. Oh my gosh, he thinks it's the end of the world. He, he starts sitting short instead of long. He's sitting two, three hours now. He's sitting one hour, one hour and a half. Why, why is that happening to him? Well, because there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, it's like, but it, this is a deep thing. And we have talked before about how we learn something. You hear me or you read it and you write it and you say it and you do it. And all these things are imprinting the mind again and again and again until you know it in more than an academic way. Academic way does not suffice for this. An academic way, you can see by what happened here in this one that we'll get to a little bit down here, why wasn't the academics able to solve this problem? Because they're stuck on being academics. You know, if they were sitting, this is something you have to see to believe. There's no way that you can decide this or that about it unless you experience it. And that's the Buddha sticking to his main frame method of teaching. You cannot stay here and practice this with me if I catch you not trying to actually see it and know it. And I know if you're fudging around because you've read the books and you come to me and describe something, the one thing you cannot fake is your face when you come out of having gone through. And you can fake it all through your practice with me as a teacher. But when you go through and come tell me you did, I know immediately when you walk in the door if you did. And it's no kidding about it. You can't fake face this. The books are making it difficult, sure. But my message to my students is don't read the books till you go through once. Come back to earth. Come back to earth and just listen to the instructions and do it and see what happens for yourself. If it's not working 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't know what that 0.1 other piece is, but 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because you're not following the instructions and we have to find out from the way you're talking about it, what it is that you're doing. And only you can tell me what to tell you to do next. <laughs> Only you can tell me in an interview what to tell you to do next. That's pretty funny in my book, but that's how it works. I just have to listen to you and you're going to tell me what to say. Okay, so like here, we must understand that the nature of the world we live in is like a river. I stuck this in here for a reason because that's part of the problem. You think that uh, a good meditation is when nothing happens. And maybe it's really long, really long. But is that really the truth? Or you have to talk to me about what's going in in there, uh, going on in there to really understand if that's true. But the reason I said what I said is because one of the things I used to do, many things I used to do, yeah. But one of the things I did for several years, I liked to escape a family of five kids and a husband. And I liked to get in a canoe and shoot the rapids with some men in the community. And when we shot the rapids on a river, when you're shooting the rapids and going through the rapids, we have to understand that the nature of the world is, is that we live in is like a river and every turn on the river is changing all the time. 
And in order to survive a row of rapids, you have to be looking forward, looking forward all the time. You're not looking behind you. You're only looking forward, forward and choosing what you're going to do with a stroke, how you're going to keep from flipping over, et cetera, and so forth. So this is what the problem is, uh, that we want to think of ourselves as living more like on a lake. Or we, we forget that it isn't a lake either. It, it, I used to tell you it was like the ocean. It has tides and it's changing all the time. But this is another simile that's really good that popped in my mind this morning because the problem is going in and being there two hours and then getting stuck. Why are you getting stuck? Because you start thinking. And what are you think? What could you be thinking about? Your own encyclopedia. And what's in your encyclopedia? All your experiences. And this has to be like something else. And it's an automatic thing that's happening that we're trying to change. Because we would like to see what the human race would be like if it was actually living in present time, in flow. If you want to talk shit, shits, and eats, and we can do that. In, in, in athletics, in flow, is this and only this is what you're doing at this time. We want to see the potential of your brain, how magnificent this can be. And it is magnificent. So let's look what happens. He when he regards the feeling as self, perception as self, formations as self, consciousness as self, then self as possessed of one consciousness. I threw the one in there because that's the problem. The self is possessed and you think of one consciousness, my consciousness consciousness as in the self or self as in the consciousness the that consciousness of his changes and it becomes otherwise and with the change of becoming otherwise of that consciousness his consciousness is preoccupied with the change of the consciousness and it can't just watch anymore it can't just watch he's he's thinking ahead too if he read the books <laughs> thinking ahead of, into something else and not he's not he's not going and wherever he goes there he is we want you to wherever you go there you are that's in the boat going down the river okay <laughs> shooting the rapids so if you're in the wherever you go there you are but this person here this person is wherever you go he's looking at where he wants to be <laughs> that's different we didn't tell you to do that we didn't tell you to do that Agitated states of mind are born of preoccupation with change. It doesn't matter if that change is change of consciousness or change of anything else. Consciousness arises together and remains in there, obsessing the mind. Because his mind is obsessed, he becomes anxious. When he's anxious, he becomes distressed. When he's distressed, he becomes concerned. When he's concerned, due to the clinging, he becomes agitated. He becomes agitated. That's it. And that is how the agitation is due to the holding on. And then the bottom part here says, how, friends, is there non-agitation due to non-clinging? Here, a well-taught person, someone who's trained in this a bit, you know, who has regard for the system of training, for the noble ones in the Dhamma, skilled in the and disciplined in the Dhamma. Discipline is to keep in line with the instructions, what the discipline is. Does not regard material form as self or self that is possessed of material form. And the, the rest of this breaks down again. And with the change uh, and becoming otherwise of that material form, so the agitated mental states born of preoccupation with change of mental forms do not arise. This is what happens. The agitated mental states born of preoccupation with change, watching for the change, the change, the change all the time. You see the problem with that when you get to nothingness? <laughs> That's a real problem. When you get to nothingness, there's nothing there. And so he's not anxious, distressed, and concerned, and due to non clinging he does not become agitated. He does not regard the feeling as self. He attempts to experiment with this. Don't believe me or try it because I told you to. 
just try it to see what it's like, you know, with the change and becoming otherwise of the, okay, I messed up. Let's see, where am I? He is not anxious, distressed, or concerned, and due to non-clinging, he does not become agitated. There you are right there, you see? He does not regard the, the feeling as self. He does not regard perception as self. He does not regard formations as self. He does not regard consciousness as self or self as possessed of consciousness or consciousness that's in the self or self as in consciousness. And that consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise. And with the change and becoming otherwise of that consciousness, his consciousness is not preoccupied. So it's like right here. And with the change, here you go. With the change and becoming otherwise of that consciousness, his consciousness is not going to be preoccupied with the change of consciousness. Agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness do not arise. This is the result of this, right? And they don't stay there obsessing his mind because his mind is not obsessed. Guess what? Wow. No more tranquil tranquilizers. Oh boy. He is not anxious. He's not distressed. He's not concerned. And due to non-clinging, he does not become agitated. And that is how there is non-agitation due to non-clinging. You see? So what is this about? Let go, let go, let go, let go. Let's have a song about let go and go down to the river and I let go I went up to the mountain and I let go I looked up at the sky and I let go I looked down in the sea and I let go hey let go let go let go why not let go and see what happens to your life you know why are we holding on to all this stuff sorry about that but it was okay you know because I was singing about Dhamma I just want you to know that <laughs> I used to sing to my Sunday school because I did not want them to forget anything. So don't tell me not to sing as long as I'm singing about Dhamma somehow. And you know, most of life is Dhamma. <laughs> but you can sing <laughs> if you're remembering to teach the Dhamma in the music. How, friends, is there non-agitation due to non-clinging? Well, here, this... This person who is practicing and is trained uh, does not regard these things as self. So here we get this is the message of impersonality. So we should stick that in here, right? We should actually put that in here. We should go over here and go like this and go like this. Um, we should mention here, this is a boost in the direction of the instruction for testing out life hmm? impersonally, huh? Impersonally. So this is about impersonal. This is hinting to us about the value of an impersonal perspective. Right? That's what they're. That's pretty good. Agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of material form do not arise together and remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not anxious, he is not distressed, and he's not concerned. And due to the non clinging, he is not become agitated. So, what can he do in the deeper states? Ah, ha, ha. He can just witness, just watch, just watch. That's all witness. You can go to any guru in India. They're going to tell you, be the witness. Next question. Be the witness. Next question. <laughs> They're always giving this message about witness your life and don't get grabbing, holding, this sort of thing. They don't go completely into the story, but they're really big on the word witness. 
and observation that we're asking you is witnessing agitated mental states born of preoccupation of change in material form, they aren't going to arise. So he doesn't regard these things uh, when there's not when there's non-clinging, he does not become agitated. So with the change of becoming otherwise of that consciousness, his consciousness is not preoccupied with the change of consciousness. He doesn't care. He's just observing, just observing. You know, anybody here people watch? Did you ever go down and sit on a bench in a congested area? I mean, even flying, you know, I do it when we have, uh, you know, seriously do it, you know, when um, I could write a book over what I see when I have a layover from a flight that's long. Just people watch. And you see most of what the Buddha is teaching, if you're concerned about how can I see this in myself, how can I see that? So watch it out there, watch it out there, yeah, in front of you. Last night, we were taken to, by some people, we were taken to a seafood a restaurant and, and eating, and I'm allowed to eat at different times. Yes, I am because of this health situation. I have all little, little meals, you know, this is an interesting experience. So have, being careful of what's happening in my body and everything, but watching the people was the treat. The food was really, really good, but the, but the treat was watching the people and the variation of people, but the similarity in the patterns of behavior in the people. And this is like where you get interested in, in psychology, watching the same, watching the patterns of people happening in the rich people here and the middle people here and the poor people there and the workers in the area there. <laughs> and you see, you can see the whole thing happening uh, three or four times in a row in an evening. It's amazing. So agitated, the, these uh, agitated states, let's see, I'm on, I think, on 22. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat, now this is near the end of this, I want to go into some of the notes are interesting on this. So this is the close of the sutta, and he's saying when he, he actually chastises them at the end, usually Kachana is chastising them at the beginning. <laughs> But of these young monks, like, why did you let the teacher go to sleep? <laughs> you had him in front of you. Why didn't you? You know, and that's interesting here because uh, these people have a free carte blanche to knock on my door. <laughs> so I can be taking a nap and okay, so what's the question? <laughs> you know, and um, we have fun because we're asking questions a lot here and, and answering questions where I am all day. So Friends, uh, when he, he rose from his seat and he went into his dwelling uh, after giving a summary in brief to you, um, that is uh, that you should examine things in such a way that while you're examining them, the consciousness is not distracted. So when you look at things, can you go to a museum and just see one exhibit at a time? Choose a, a museum that you like. It doesn't matter if it's uh, his car museum. <laughs> or, or, or a really fine art museum or uh, a clock museum. But can you go in and see the exhibits or the exhibits of the Royal House, uh, the jewels? Can you go and actually go through? That's really hard because they're so beautiful. And if you get to ever see them uh, on, when they travel around the world, they take some around the world and you can see them and you just want to stay in front of one thing. I remember one time that was really serious about staying in front of something to see it long enough. It was in the 1960s at the World Fair. They brought the Pieta statue of Michelangelo to New York. And they had an exhibit, but they had you on a moving track that was moving past it. And I wanted to go. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I just wanted to go back. And I wanted to stand in front of it and just contemplate it. And that's what you need to, to see that experience of contemplating something just by itself and, and, and seeing it that way and not, not losing it, you know, not trying to see it quickly, but to understand it and practice what we're saying here. 
So it tells you once again, the agitated, uh, you know, friends, um, let's see, he told you in brief and you're not stuck. So it's scattered externally is what you need to remember or stuck internally. And so by not clinging, he does not become agitated if his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally. And if by not clinging, he does not become agitated, then for him, there is no origination of suffering, of birth, aging, death in the future. I understand the detailed meaning of the summary to be thus. And that's what he's trying to get across. If you do this long enough and you train your brain in this direction, that's it. That's what's happening. He's giving you the final, the final result. Now, friends, if you wish to go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this as the Blessed One explains it to you, then you should remember it. And the bhikkhus, having delighted and rejoiced in the Mahakachana's words, they rose up from their seats, okay, and they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side, and they told him, then, Venerable Sir, we went to the, uh, the uh, Venerable Mahakachana and asked him the meaning, and he said, expounded the meaning to us in these terms and statements. And then, you know, the Buddha said, that's good, because Mahakachana is wise, and he knows what he's doing, and <laughs> you can always run to him, so I can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what he's saying, so I can go to sleep, because I am strong in the hands of these arahats. They understand what's really going on. Now, the notes in this are varied, but I want to take you to one particular note on here. And this is the one, uh, 1253. And um, this is expressly went to this one, okay, uh, because of the student I'm working with here, and, and the fact that they're caught in this in this idea of nothingness is disturbing. So now this is going to show you how these notes work. All of the known additions, I'm at the note number 1253. All known additions of the Pali texts of 138, which Bhikkhu Bodhi researched um, here, Anupada Paritas, Paritasana, I'm, uh, parit, I'm sorry, Paritasana, literally means agitation due to non-clinging. Now that's what it means. Now this is what, which obviously this contradicts what the Buddha consistently is teaching that agitation rises from clinging, from holding on to something and ceases with the removal of clinging, right? So there is this one piece of poly that's in there that was confusing everybody. So however, this reading, apparently it predates the commentaries. And from the MA, which is the main commentary on this, um, accepts Anupada as correct and offers the following explanation. In what sense is there agitation due to non-clinging? So how can you have, what state, can you imagine in your mind, what state would there be agitation due to not clinging? Can you think of that? What state would there be agitation due to non-clinging? The answer is nothingness. And so here was the answer I've been seeking for the last three days for this to try to explain what's going on for the student and uh, through the non-existence of anything to cling to, you see? For if there existed any formation that were permanent and stable, a self and the belonging of a self, it would be possible to cling to it. But there is uh, then this agitation would be agitation due to clinging, not having something to cling to. I don't think I did that. Something, I didn't mean to do that. I need to take that out. Something to cling to. But because there is no formation 
that can be clung to when, when in the base of nothingness. I put that in there. Thus, then even though material form, etc., uh, all the other pieces of it are, cl can, are clung to with the idea material form is self, and uh, they are not in all the other things that they say about that, all those different phrases. Uh, they are not clung to in the way they are conceived, the way we think of them, they are not there in nothingness. And thus, what is here called agitation due to non-clinging is the meaning of agitation due to clinging by way of views. Now, the by way of views, I disagree with because, but I'm trying to demonstrate, but this could have would have been this saying that it was clinging by way of views that could have been surmised by someone who never sat in the base of nothingness. And what we have to take into consideration here is when you're talking about Nanamoli, but venerable Nanamoli or Bhikkhu Bodhi, or even going back to Leti Sayadaw going back, 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 you have to go back. We don't know how long it has been since monks have been able to routinely sit in the levels. We do not know. It could be very long, very far back. So you had followed this reading on the basis of MA's explanation had rendered the phrase anguish, uh, agitation, Bikubodi prefers agitation. I kind of agree with him because agitation is the point of the beginning of the other words due to not finding anything to cling to. The agitation is not finding something to cling to, but this is the nature. I'm trying to show you, this is the nature of the state of nothingness. It, uh, it, it's a very logical point of view. If you want to talk about views, you know, it's very logical to understand if there's nothing there, how can you hold on to something? He did not discuss the problem in his notes. Bhikkhu Bodhi is making a point of telling you that Nanamoli didn't go into this a great deal. Um, he just didn't go into the subject a great deal. In his notes, when he left the notes on this work, and this work was completed by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi after Nanamoli was gone. Uh, a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, Okay, a sutta that's in the, the uh, Samyutta Nikaya, uh, 227, it's in book 22, um, this number seven, is virtually identical with this passage in, in 138, except that here it reads, as we should expect, upada paritasthana, li literally mean, meaning agitation due to clinging. So from, from, uh, from the Samyutta text, uh, we can safely infer that the Majima reading is kind of an error, the way it's set up that, that should be discounted. But my rendering here is based on the reading in, in 22.7. I.B. Horner, uh, too, he also follows the latter text um, in explaining this, and I.B. Horner was one of the ones way back. So I'm going to take the Sam Nikaya now and read you this one because this one is very, it's on uh, the Sam Nikaya. If you have the Sam Nikaya, it's on page 865, and the title to it um, is um, Agitation Through Clinging. Agitation Through Clinging. Okay. Monks, I will teach you agitation through clinging and non-agitation through non-clinging. Listen to that and attend closely and I will speak. Yes, venerable sir. And these monks, they replied, and the blessed one said this. And how, monks, is there agitation through clinging? Here, Here, monks, the uninstructed worldling who is not a seer of the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, the one who is not uh, a person who is visiting superior persons and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards form as self 
or self as possessing form or form as in yourself or self in the form. That form of his changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of form, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of the form. Agitation and a constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form remain obsessing his mind. It just means you get addicted to holding on to forms that you see or sounds that you hear. You get hold, wanting to hold on to them. Because his mind is obsessed, he is frightened, he's distressed, and he's anxious. And through clinging or holding on, he becomes agitated. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. Wow. <laughs> okay. And that consciousness of his changes and it alters. And with the change and alteration of consciousness, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of the consciousness. Agitation and a constellation of mental states are born of preoccupation with the change of the consciousness and remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is obsessed, he's frightened, distressed, and, and anxious. And through clinging, he becomes agitated. It is in this way that there is agitation through clinging. And how is there non-agitation through non-clinging? Well, here, the instructed noble disciple, who is a seer of the noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who is a seer of superior persons and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, he does not regard form as self or self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. He doesn't take anything personally. He just is observing. This is what he's doing. He's not taking anything personally. And that form of his will change and alter. Uh, despite the change and alteration of the form, his consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of form. Then no agitation and constellation of uh, mental states or in a preoccupation with the change of the form remain obsessing his mind. And because his mind is not obsessed, he is not frightened distressed, not anxious. And through non-clinging, he does not become agitated. So he does not regard the feeling as self or perception as self or volitional formations as self or consciousness as self or self as possessing consciousness or consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness. That consciousness of his changes and it alters. Despite the change and alteration of the consciousness, his consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of the consciousness. And no agitation and constellation of mental states are born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness and remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not frightened, he is not distressed, he is not anxious, and through non-clinging, he does not become agitated. And it is in such a way uh, that there is non-agitation through non-clinging. So this is supporting everything that we just said in the Samhita Nikaya, in this little sutta. It's very, very nice that you find this. I always say that 
you know, the SEMUTA is a really nice support system. So I'm going to throw this out to questions. Anybody has any questions? Um, we can, you know, you can ask now and um, get this, um, stop the share for a second. Yeah? Yeah, okay. You, I see you. Uh, lovely to see you, uh, Sister Gima. Um, well, thank you. This is a, a lovely sutta. Um, I've got uh, two, um, I think I've got two questions. Um, can you say a little more about in uh, verse 21? Um, it says it has this lovely phrase, that consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise. Can you elaborate that? This is in twenty in twenty one. You're going in, back into in the, in the Majjhima Nikaya. Yeah. Okay, in twenty one. All right, let me go back here. In twenty one, how friends is there non agitation due to non clinging? And what was the phrase, the piece you said? Um, it's uh, towards the end of paragraph twenty or uh, verse twenty one. So I think you might need to go down the screen a little. Mm -hmm. Can't quite see it yet. Keep going down. Um, Twenty-one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Whoa, whoa, there we are. Um, it's uh, this uh, just two paragraphs up from twenty-two. It says, "With the change and becoming otherwise of that consciousness." Uh, oh no, no! Hold on, I've got a slightly different one. With the change, with the change, the change happens and becoming otherwise of that consciousness, his consciousness is not preoccupied with the change of consciousness. So consciousness, you know, he, he understands, this is the student who has been exposed to the training, okay? And he understands that any change that's occurring, any change, including the change of your consciousness, consciousness cognizes and, and tries to cognize what's going on. And so when you're, when you're, um, you're sitting there and you're watching something and uh, with the change and become, it's becoming otherwise, he knows that his consciousness is, he's not going to be preoccupied with the change of his consciousness. Now, this would be a very good example for, for Cameron in his situation, the student that is having some trouble in, inside. So he's sitting there, okay, and he's watching nothingness, okay? Mm -hmm and there's nothing happening. And then his consciousness, his he knows there's nothing there and he's attempting to watch nothingness. And this is the frustrating thing for the teacher as well as the student in trying to talk about it. And he's attempting to watch nothing, okay? And then his consciousness changes and shifts in some way about how he's cognizing what he's watching. Do you get it? Okay, and as that's happening, he sees that he is not pre, he doesn't get preoccupied with that change of consciousness, he just continues watching in spite of it. So it's like he sees this change in consciousness as a, a hindrance coming up, and he's just let go, relax, smile, and keep watching. See, that's what that is. You get it? Uh, yes, it's the, it's the, yes, that, that's lovely. The sentence above that. Uh, it says that consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise. So we've it. got this, we've got this preoccupation with identity, and then we drop the, the preoccupation. Presumably, this is referring to dropping the mm -hmm. identity uh, with or uh, dropping the identification with the experience. Um, That's right. And then that consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise. The becomes otherwise, then this is a uh, um, yes. Can you it say starts, it a bit more? No, it, it, he starts switching what he's what. Okay, consciousness cognizes it cognizes. So we mm -hmm. look at what cognition is, and cognizing is to understand. We can go in here and yep. check, see what else we've got for synonyms for consciousness. Um, and this bugs me because I'll, my little book sometimes it doesn't have um, <laughs> my small one doesn't have what I need, but 
uh, in the larger one, you would find all the variations of consciousness. Wait a second. Um, let's see. <laughs> see, this one does a, a it pulls a whammy on me <laughs> because it says conscious and um, to be con it uses the adjective form, but it doesn't take the noun consciousness in this book. If you have a larger, um, a larger um, thesaurus and you go in, you get a better idea. Um, in the adjective, the person is awake, he's aware, he's sentient, he's responsive, he's alert. This is describing he, the person is conscious, but consciousness cognizes. So when do I try cognize? Let's see whether cognize is here. Um, wait a second. Maybe I can go from that angle to do it um, and see if we can find it. G -H -I -G. I don't think Cognize is there. No, see, they left it out. This is not a great big one. <laughs> this is a small one I carry around with me. Cognition and Cognize are not in here. Hmm. So wait, maybe I did it on my phone before. Let me see if I did it on my phone. Fine. Do you have a phone? Grab your phone and go just in the main thing, uh, define. Okay, the state and consciousness, the state of being aware of and responsive to one's surroundings. You see, being aware, person's awareness or perception of something. And so like if you perceive something and your consciousness changes, you're trying to perceive. And the frustration we meet when we're, when we're going, in, going through nothingness is stepping away from perceiving, is attempting to perceive. Because our frustration is our whole life is based on perceiving something, right? And perceiving is naming something and we can't name it. And so our frustration that we hit in, in nothingness, when you look at that word, consciousness, okay? So he's what's happening is he's slipping over into changing his perception, changing his perceiving, his, his conscious awareness of it. And there's nothing there, you see? So this frustration is what the student runs into in, in this. And, and then if they... Are, they're actually, once they get a little bit frustrated about not being able to say what it is, <laughs> they, get, they fall back into, but I'm supposed, I am supposed to be able to perceive, perceive what I see. And it's a very frustrating thing, right? And you're supposed to be stepping back. Why? Because you can't slip into neither perception or non-perception uh, from the state of nothingness unless you're not there. It's a really strange thing. And then even, you know, not, neither perception or non-perception is very slippery because we can't, when the student comes to you and starts talking to you about, I knew I was in it, you know that they weren't. <laughs> it's a very strange thing. If they uh, they will come a particular way and, and, and uh, they can post talk about it as they're coming out. And that's why we, we used to tell them, get up and start walking around. When we were in South Korea, we were telling them just get up and walk around and, and then start recalling. 
and say to your brain what just happened because they were confused about what happened and they would recall and the things would pop up the moment. And the idea here was the last effort of sterilizing your, the area, <laughs> so to speak, if you were sterilizing a house, this is the last effort of cleaning, absolutely. So it's a sterile environment you're supposed to be letting go up no matter what it is. And don't get into any story about what it was you saw, nothing. If it's a, if it's a color, if it's a, a, a print, a shape, a, a, a movement, uh, any sort of light, anything at all, you're supposed to let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Why? Because once again, when, you, when you're in that area beyond nothingness, you're attempting to not be there at all. The only way you can go into cessation, which is the neurota to fall over into it, the only way that can happen is if you're not there anymore. You see? So it's a very high, how do you talk about, this is the game, you know, this is the ongoing game for centuries. <laughs> how do we talk about neurota samapati? How do we do that? You see? because it's a, a place of no concept at all, a place of no tension, no tightness whatsoever. I am not there whatsoever in any way, shape or force. How do we, how do we describe this place? It's a place of no concepts. And the problem is our language in every language on the planet. Every word in the language is a concept. We played that game once while I was driving a few thousand miles with Bonte of trying to figure out a one, one come up with one word, one, one thing that was not a concept. Because I, we started laughing, I think, mostly before we stopped for lunch someplace. We started laughing because A, and and the, all three are concepts. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> You know, you can, you make it come, you know, A is obviously a something singular, right? And the is an introduction to something. It is, a, it is necessary. It, it is absolutely a concept too. And end implies plural something. So it's not pure either as nothing. You see? <laughs> Yeah, we used to go bonkers over these things. But in, in cognizing, in, uh, when you're saying consciousness cognizes, that's what it does in the verb form. It cognizes. And cognizing to cognize something is to, to understand it, right? Comprehend it, understand it. So we go to cognize, to know it or become aware of it. We cognize the system, yeah, mm -hmm. of the rules or the system of something. We cognize the horse, the this, the that. Yeah, we cognize it. And that's what it's doing. And so... Uh, the consciousness, they're using this in the form of you have to stop completely. And so when I say this to you, I'm not saying you have to stop. I'm saying experiment by stopping. <laughs> I'm having to express this a lot lately because somebody wrote against us in a serious way <laughs> and we still don't know who the teachers were involved in this. They did not reveal who in the world the teachers were. They were no one, I can guarantee, involved with the, the uh, directly with Dhammasukha Meditation Center at all whatsoever in any way, shape or form. But, but when you consider what was being said, it was like, how could they, even imply that anyone said you have to do this this way. Well, I think if you heard it wrong, I, I have given a lot of benevolent allowance in this whole situation. And if you were someone in another, another language and you heard me say, um, you know, uh, you need to do this, people don't listen to everything you say. That's what you have to remember in conversation. So if I were to say to you, 
in order for this to work, you have to do this this way. And they walk around saying, she says, I have to do this. What if I don't want to? See? But this has nothing to do with what I said. <laughs> I said, in order for this to operate the right way, this is what has to happen. This is what we have found has to happen. And I say a lot of times to you, this is what we have found works and operates. I'm only the person, the guide who's been over the mountain a few times. Okay. <laughs> And I'm only telling you what I know about the trail, what I know about the path from going over the mountain a number of times and showing other people how to go over the mountain without getting killed, you know? That's what's happening here. So we're only merely telling you from the text, this is what we see it meaning because that's what worked for us and we're showing you, go on and try it, maybe you'll like it. And that's all we're saying to you, yeah? So in cognizing, what do you think? Am I answering this fairly or did I go way off? <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is nice. Um, I've, I've got uh, uh, another question, but I don't know if it's appropriate in this forum uh, to just ask a question about my own practice. You can dive in if it's on the subject matter, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, uh, uh, there's very little form at all in uh, uh, the object of uh, attention. Uh, there's mm -hmm. just a, occasionally a change in color. Um, a bit like, you know, how you can get floaters across your eyes. It's just, yeah. it's just, so that passes through and I'm just basically staying with the awareness that there's nothing else uh, at the moment. And, uh, and that- Are we, and that, are, we in, are we in nothing? Well, Is that where we are? That, that may well be where I am, yes. It's, it's been like this for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, so I'm just I'm just staying I'm just staying with that and that can last. Um, I might get a minor a minor distraction, but the distractions literally last perhaps um, uh, three or four seconds. That's that's it. How are how are you? How long are you sitting? Um, usually no more than about uh, an hour or um, seventy or eighty minutes, something like that. Okay. All right. And how long before you're pulled off to something? Or the, the mind's attention moves away from um, what you're watching? I, I would say there's flickers in mind's attention every perhaps five, six, seven minutes or something like that. But the flicker is literally, it, it's, it's barely a distraction. Okay, well, then it's not a distraction, really. Okay, what's your subject, your objective going in? How are you going in? From the directions? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But the directions don't seem to last very long at all. I sure. Seem to move in. Because you I just fall in right in. Quickly. Because you're yeah. sitting regularly, you fall right in. If you just do a couple, a little bit of it, I understand. Yeah. And pretty soon you don't need it. Pretty soon you sit down and you go into where you're working. I know. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, so the question is what? Uh, just that I've been staying with this for uh, quite a long time, um, just to continue as that, um, because uh, yeah, uh, that's, that seems to be what my practice is. Um, how, do you sit once a week without the clock? Um, I quite often don't sit without a clock, yeah. You don't sit without a clock, right? No, um, I don't necessarily um, set a time. I don't necessarily set an alarm. Okay, so you're sitting without a clock, but you're only up to, okay, so you need to ask the question, why do I come out at seven? At, why is it that I'm coming out? You need to ask, your, when you do these questions, when you ask why, why am I coming out at, uh, at 70 minutes? You know, why am I coming out at 70 minutes or at a, a particular time? And then start your sitting. Don't try to answer it. Don't get involved with it. You just throw it to your brain. Why am I coming out like that? The question. And then see what happens. You know, he may think that, uh, you know, you should come out at that time, that that's what you usually come out at. If you're okay. sitting at a usual time, he may be popping you out. He may think that he's just helping you, you know, inside. 
but you can ask the question and let your intuition, your intuition just follow. And if you feel like you're coming out, um, you know, and there's, you can't see any obvious reason why you're coming out, then sit through, just sit through and see what happens. Okay. And see if, you know, if you're sitting that way, I'd like to see you get up to, uh, you know, go for two, go for two right now. And just say, I'm going to go for two hours. I'm going to sit for two hours. If you want to say that, you can say that. See what happens with your, with your um, right, determinations, with your determinations. Because I know you've been sitting long enough. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes on the sit, I can have my, uh, my eyes will just spontaneously open and just close. There doesn't seem to be an intention to open. Okay. When your eyes pop open, okay. You just let them pop open. And what mm -hmm. will happen is they'll go open and they'll just fall down like halfway, yep. okay? Don't make them close. When they're finished, they'll just close. Okay. And usually this is kind of an internal point of joy somewhere in your body. There's an internal point of joy, but mm -hmm. that's what the artist was trying to get across when he was doing this on the statues. He's trying to get across that when you reach, um, you touch like, and at this level, you can touch all pervading joy is beginning to pop up. Another thing that you can do if you're in nothingness and you've been in there a long time is you can spend this time seeing for yourself if you're, you need to check the parts of the, the factors. You need to check, spend a little time with a balancing bar. I call it a balancing bar where you're walking on a tightrope and you're going over a crevice and you're in nothingness, right? And you want to see how you can get to the other side of this nothingness. So you're holding the bar, you know, you're holding the bar, you hold these bars with two hands and they're very long, you know? And you have, and the, you just mindfulness is just, you just keep watching, but you're checking investigation energy and joy and you're checking tranquility concentration and equanimity the balance of them and you're checking to see if they're just balanced or if something is out of balance are you tipping are you tipping mm. the other thing is you might find out that you're tipping at the point where you're falling out of the practice you'll you'll spot it okay um so the investigation uh whilst in this state what what is um what is that the investigation because the investigation is the frustrating piece what is nothingness yeah, yeah. what is nothingness <laughs> you know you so, were there you know and and see why is it why is it so frustrating because when you say what is the base of infinite space you've got something to watch you know, I love infinite space. I could sit there all day. You know, I love the vastness of it, you know. And then when you're sitting there with infinite consciousness, if you're if you're if you have experienced infinite consciousness and you're able to get to the place where you're watching the consciousness as you've accepted that you can see them, it comes from way out here like that in to a contraction. And you sit there and watch them and you watch them coming up. And if you just watch underneath, they'll slow down more and more. And you watch how deeply can I detect these consciousnesses arising? What's happening that makes them arise? By now, there's just no hindrances whatsoever that are going to disturb you because you've owned, you finally get to the point where you have owned the idea um, that there is absolutely no reason to do anything except abandon a hindrance. The only thing you were interested in it early in your practice was to understand that they always arise in the same precise way. That's what you were interested in. How does this part of the operation, how does it work? And, and also, is it true that and Nietzsche is consistent. Those two pieces you're, you're, you're watching very carefully. You're learning, you're learning. You're not spending time concentrating on them. But our concentration is a collectedness. It is a balanced form of concentration. It is not obscure from the Vasudhi Maga. If you go to the Vasudhi Maga on the very first page where Buddha Gosa is explaining 
concentration, he says that he, he wants to, he gives you a bunch of examples and then he summarizes and he says, on like the first page of that whole section, chapter three, he says that when I'm talking about concentration in this book, in this project, I'm talking about a profitable level of concentration. And what could that be? That could that means something that allows me to see clearly the four noble truths, dependent origination, the three characteristics, how everything is working, how it all operates, how it's all connected, not separated. It's not in a bunch of mailboxes and you take one piece at a time. I was reading a book once and it was about the seven factors of enlightenment. And I was certain absolutely certain that this author was going to go through each part of the seven factors of enlightenment. And at the end, he was going to show you how they were connected. And he didn't. He only spoke about studying them as individual pieces, you see. And this was true when he also wrote about uh, the Satipatthana in the four foundation practice of body, feeling, perception, and uh, body, feeling, mind, and dhammas. This was true also there. And that's a big mistake. I'm sorry, it's a mistake because you cannot study body by itself, uh, feeling by itself, especially feeling. You, you meet a monk and, or, or a person, you meet a person practicing and they say, what are you practicing? What's your object? Feeling. Ah, just feeling, just feeling, nothing else, just feeling. You know, you really want them to talk to you a little bit more because feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined. And you cannot separate these. They are no way can you dis make them disjoint. These are conjoined. These three pieces are just like this three, these three. There, boom, it's a molecule. You cannot take it apart. It's like the H, the two, and the O. You can't separate it. It's water. You cannot take it apart. Okay, so there's no way that you can practice feeling as your object alone. No way, okay? Because you have to be conscious to practice it, and you have to perceive it, don't you, to understand. And so you play this game. I was really saying that's it. You certainly can, because I had read all these books about only this, only this, only this, only this. And there was no only this, you know, so practicing, you know, it's just really, I'm not laughing at who wrote this. It's just fun that I was so adamant that you could practice it. And Bhante said, go take a walk. <laughs> walk down the road to the end and come back. That's about a mile <laughs> where it was. And I started walking. And if I'm going to, if how can I be conscious if I can't perceive and feel the consciousness? How can I perceive something without being conscious and feeling it? How can I feel something without perceiving it? And I have to be conscious to do it. Do you see? So there's no way you can do this. And this is why we, we are adamant. I don't care if it's there in the poly or not, but when you say perception and feeling with, is gone, it's actually perception, feeling, and consciousness that's gone when you fall into cessation. It can't be perception and feeling is gone, but consciousness is remaining. It can't be, you see? And the person who's who's talking that way, how did they get to talk that way? They're talking that way academically from not practicing and discovering that you cannot have just perception and feeling disappear, you see, without consciousness disappearing to really fall into momentarily go unconscious with no feeling or perception. Now, you can't scream at me, that's impossible. The person would be dead. That's not true. Why? Because of the lessons on heat and vitality. 
because your heat and your vitality are still there, but the tree fell on me. And when the tree fell on me, I went unconscious. And believe me, I did not perceive or feel anything and I was unconscious. So I know I'm not dead because they <laughs> because I kept coming out of conscious, unconsciousness into consciousness long enough to see Stephen standing above me saying, what do I do now? <laughs> And I've got the tree on top of me. Okay. And I'm there, go get the monk or call the helicopter. And then I went unconscious again. <laughs> it's so funny, you know. And then he, he went to get him. And then Bonte comes back and he waits until I, he said I was coming in and out to Bonte. And he waits and he says, okay, how's it going? <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> so I immediately give him a report on my body from my head to my foot. And then I went unconscious. <laughs> and then he waits a few minutes and I come back and he says, okay, we're, we're going to check and see if anything's broken. Which the only time in 22 years he ever, ever touched me was when he was checking my body that day to, to see if there was anything broken. <laughs> And he finally decides there's not anything broken. We're going to lift the tree, at which point I went unconscious. <laughs> and I'm coming. Then when he finally gets the tree off me, we figured out that my leg was all right and everything was all right. Then they decide, OK, we're going to walk you over to the, can you get up? They got me up and um, took me to the trailer and uh, got me to lay down and said, just lay down. Well. You know me, I, mean, I lay down for 45 minutes and then I went out and worked with the tractor. <laughs> I mean, if I'm all together, it means I should start start working again. So I just went out and started working and he came running down. So aren't you going to rest? I said, no, no, it's all right. Everything works. Once you find out everything works, so everything works. So that's where that was story. But consciousness, feeling and perception are one thing, yeah? And so when you're talking about consciousness and the consciousness is this awareness. And so in nothingness, you get frustrated because there's nothing there. And you know what? You don't think um, on the surface that you are frustrated with this. I noticed this with Cameron, you know, uh, that I noticed that um, it's a subconscious uh, frustration. It's like a subconscious pushing up, like you're trying to let go of all of this and you know you're supposed to let go of it all, but you're letting go of what? That's <laughs> what they say to me. What are we letting go of? <laughs> Just let it go, you know? So it's this whole thing, you know? Yeah. I may I just ask or just to say one more, one more thing? Yeah. Now, I, I just thought you'd be interested. The um, this phrase uh, stuck. Um, if you look at the Pali, it also has a meaning of unslackened. So you know, when a rope is slack, it's got no tension in it. So right. if, so the this word stuck means unslackened. In other words, tight. Yeah, like. Yeah, like it's not slack yet. It just has yeah. to be let it go. Just let it yeah. go. And so, so this, this, feeling, this. So, yeah, so here's my Sunday school class. All right. A feeling is just arising. And this is not surprising. And whenever a feeling's arising, you let it go, let it go, let it go. And experiential learning is what keeps the big reel turning. But whenever you want to let go, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be tension free. Now formations are just arising with consciousness close behind. Mentality, materiality, and the sixth sense doors divine. When contact is sure to happen and clinging is right behind. Habitual tendencies rising. Oh, habitual tendencies rising. Oh, wait a minute. That messed up. I messed up the song. <laughs> what did I leave out? Feeling? Did I leave feeling out? You, I you, think you so. All right, let's do it again. Ready? 
whenever a feeling's arising, this is not surprising. And whenever the feeling's arising, let it be, let it be, let it be. Experiential learning is what keeps the big wheel turning. So whenever you want to, when you want to be tension free, let it be, let it be, let it be. Now, formations are just arising and consciousness close behind mentality, materiality, and the sixth sense door is divine, then feeling is sure to happen and craving is right behind. Clinging is coming faster, habitual tendencies not advised. So whenever the feelings arising, don't let it be surprising. And whenever the feelings arising, let it go, let it go, let it go. Now here's what you need to know when the feeling begins to grow. Just smile, let your tension free and go. Let it be, let it be, let it be. There you go. Okay. That's the class. Thank you very much, sister. <laughs> This nun is insatiable. She still thinks she's in the Abbey. <laughs> this poor little, Ju you know, what's her name? Julie, um, Julie what? Yeah, right. She's still rolling over because of my song. <laughs> okay, so let's do a prayer. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May this... <laughs> May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, we always like to make the bell Sister. happy. <laughs> bye bye. I'll see you uh, next week. Okay. And uh, we'll be doing uh, the second one of these suttas, the next one, next time. We're going to break that one down because it has the same subject matter, but let's see what it does with it. It's interesting to see one of them, you know, compound the one before. Okay. So come on back and join us next week. <laughs> bye bye, everybody.